at number 10, Baby Night. I know that when someone asks a little kid what they want to be when they grow up, some of them might respond with saying something like a princess or a cowboy or a knight. But back in the medieval age, kids were really becoming knights, not just when they grew up. Knights started training when they were between the ages of 7 and 10, so their childhoods were pretty short lived. In this day and age, kids that age are starting elementary school and are still too short to ride most rides at the theme park, but back in the day, they were being trained to go off to war. Sounds like a pretty sucky situation but it gets even worse when you realize that most of these young knights didn't even get a choice in the matter. Parents back then controlled what their kids' futures were going to look like, and there was nothing that their kids could do or say about it, so if they were to be trained as a knight and go off to war, that's exactly what was going to happen. At number 9, Squires. Now even though kids as young as 7 years old would be shipped off to train as a knight, luckily no one was going to send these kids out into battle just yet. Before they could even think about seeing the battlefield, they had to go through training. First they started off as pages. The pages mostly did menial tasks like working in the stables and serving food to the knights, but they also learned to ride horses and use a sword. A few years later, when they were about 14 years old, they would graduate to become a squire where they were assigned to a specific knight, sort of like an assistant. The squire would do some pretty menial tasks for their assigned knight, and they would clean and polish the knight's armor and sword, tend to the knight's horse, and help the knight get into their armor for battle. Most squires got through these tasks with the dream that one day they would become a knight themselves and have a squire of their own, but unfortunately in some cases, some squires never became knights and they stayed a squire even past the age of 18 when most squires would become knights. Seems a little unfair to me, but I guess in that case you wouldn't be burdened with the knowledge that you could die on the battlefield since you would never make it there. Before we continue learning about medieval knights and how messed up their lives were, why not consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, training. When you picture what it would look like to see squires training, what do you imagine? Do you picture kids fighting with wooden swords or practicing how to put on armor? Well, you can put that out of your mind because that image is more sunshine and rainbows than what actually went on because training to be a knight was a very grueling process. When a page graduated to become a squire, they then had to master the seven points of agility. The seven points of agility were sort of like sports that would help the squires become good knights. They had to master shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, and tournament sports like jousting and dancing. Yes, that is more than seven, but let's just agree that medieval math was flawed and not think about it too hard. Other than the physical skills that they had to master, squires also had to learn how to recite poetry, hunt, play chess, and impress the ladies because even though they were going to be slaying people on the battlefield, they still needed to be able to win a woman's heart. Unfortunately, even with all of this training, many young knights died in their first battles, but at least they tried their best, right? At number seven, too much poop. Here's a real downside to being a knight in the medieval era. While we've been taught that knights were these amazing, brave, chivalrous men that would rescue a princess and live happily ever after, the reality is that they were actually a bunch of dudes on a muddy battlefield with poor hygiene that were literally pooping themselves to death. Many knights who embarked on crusades had a lot of parasites and diseases, and one illness that proved most problematic was dysentery. Dysentery is an illness that basically causes super poops due to a parasite. So these knights were out trying to win back the holy lands while their tum tums were throwing up gang signs get mad rumbly on the battlefield. It is believed that these knights contracted dysentery through drinking tainted water, and because medicine was basically a myth at this point, once you contracted dysentery, you could basically kiss your life goodbye and your stomach contents goodbye. The most famous case of death by butt explosion was from the Seventh Crusade, where Louis IX had contracted dysentery and had his pants cut because he was tired of having to pull them down every time he felt a rumbly in his tumbly. This all sounds like such a horrible way to go and a serious downside to be a knight. At number six, armor. We all have a pretty good idea of what knights look like, right? The shiny metal armor, the chain mail and helmet. Well, as cool as they may have looked, the armor that knights wore was actually pretty impractical when it came to agility because there was just no way you could move very easily when wearing it. These knights had to carry around a lot of weight. Hollywood made us believe that swords that knights used were incredibly heavy, but in reality they only weighed about 3-5 to five pounds. Yeah, they were pretty hefty, but nowhere near the kind of weight that knights were carrying on their bodies because of their armor. The average medieval suit of armor weighed between 45 and 55 pounds, and just the helmet alone weighed 4-8 to eight pounds. Knights on the battlefield had to worry about fighting, staying alive, and carrying an extra 45 pounds on them, but knights who jousted 
Ironhead had it even worse because their armor was known to weigh twice as much as battle armor. These knights had to be very strong in order to carry that around, otherwise they would have collapsed under the weight of their gear when they got too tired to keep going. At number 5, always in danger. When knights weren't out in some kind of battlefield, they didn't just get to sit around doing nothing waiting for the next battle. They were still knights and people loved them, so they had to entertain people through tournaments. This wasn't your average tournament like when you went to a medieval times as a kid because this was way bloodier and safety was not really much of a priority. It wasn't as dangerous as going off to battle, but there was still a risk that knights had to take and sometimes it ended fatally. Tournaments would normally involve two different events, melee and jousting. We all know what jousting is though, right? It's where two knights on horseback charge at each other with lances trying to knock their opponent off their horse. This sport injured and even killed people in the past. In 1559, the king of France, Henry II, was killed during a jousting tournament because his opponent's lance broke apart and sent splinters into his eyes and brain. These tournaments were meant for fun and games and entertainment, but they often ended in bloodshed in some ways, so these knights always had to risk their lives even when they weren't in an active fight. At number 4, Fired As with any kind of job, medieval knights could get fired. These days, if you get fired, you just have to find another job to fall back on, but for knights, they had it much, much worse. Knights served their kings, and so if they did anything that went against their monarch, or if they did something that the king didn't like, they could essentially be fired from being a knight, since the king is the one who made them one in the first place. What the king giveth, he could take it away, pretty much. When a knight was fired, the king would start by hacking off the knight's spurs, then they would break their sword, then they would burn the knight's coat of arms, and hang their shield upside down for the entire kingdom to see, because these people really liked public humiliation. And if you thought that was enough, just you wait, because on top of the spurs and the sword and the shield, they would also execute the knight for good measure, so really, you never ever want to get fired back then, because it would really end badly for you. At number 3, Burial. For medieval knights, dying was just part of the job. When someone became a knight, they knew that this was a risk that they were going to have to take. And for some knights, they worried about where they would be buried because it had to be in the right spot, otherwise they wouldn't go to heaven. When a knight died in battle, their body had to be buried in the right kind of dirt, and that was the consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. To solve this problem for young knights, when they were knighted, they would also be given a burial plot in a church graveyard so they knew that they were guaranteed a spot in heaven when they died. This, however, created a bit of a loophole for anyone wanting to get a one-way ticket to heaven because even older knights who enlisted later in life would be able to get buried beneath a stone effigy in a church and be able to go to heaven even if they really never did all that churchy stuff beforehand. At number 2, Yummy People As you could probably imagine, for medieval knights, desperate times called for desperate measures. Oftentimes during battles, supplies would run out and knights would be left dealing with starvation on top of everything else that they were going through. This proved to be a huge problem during the crusades because after supplies and food started to run out, people got desperate and started seeing other people as snacks if you know what I mean. Some of the poorest crusaders resorted to eating people to get them through their journey to take back the holy lands and as you can imagine, it was a pretty gory sight to see. Knights back then recalled seeing enemy forces on spits and dismembered people just laying around in plain view. It was rough being a knight back then and the amount of shortcuts and strategies people came up with just to survive got real dark real fast. And finally at number 1, dehydration. On top of not having enough to eat, many knights from the crusades also didn't have anything to drink and many of them died of dehydration. Dehydration was especially deadly during heat waves. At one point things got so bad for knights embarking on their holy war that 500 knights died of dehydration in just one summer back in 1097. Since it was such a terrible way to go, people started weaponizing dehydration so to speak. This happened when the Sultan Saladin lured the enemy forces away from their water source and set a fire to the grass around the enemy troops, causing them to overheat. Because they couldn't drink anything and because of the intense heat, the troops got too weak to fight back and then they were defeated by Saladin. The elements were so intense that these knights really had it bad. Weaponizing dehydration, that is a super messed up thing to do, but back then, people were ruthless. At number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked, and while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame, ding ding ding, shame, 
You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded and it was quite the spectacle. Now would you rather experience this or being cancelled on social media? Let me know. At number 9, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck out the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I am so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number 8, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon? Not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank god we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number 7, no pleasure. The dark ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top, or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number 6, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? Huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun. The cemetery. Yep. You're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husband, although corpse if you're watching hit me up. Thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. 
At number five, an eye for an eye. When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person. You know. Since these people were very religious, they also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well, so usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number 4, The King's Evil Being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil. And you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number 3, Toothworms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the dark ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number two, judging tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. 
However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that your wine colored pee is a bad thing. Okay, number 10, location, location, location. So first off, let's begin at the very foundation as to why medieval castles were built in the first place. And the biggest hint lies in where they were built. From the 11th century onwards, medieval castles were built for a few reasons. One, to demonstrate wealth. Two, provide a place of defense and retreat. And thirdly, to defend important passageways and landways. Oh, and uh, it was a nice place to live. But specifically because of the last few reasons, where a castle was built really, really mattered. Some were built by the sea to have a strong advantage over naval attacks, or they were built on hilltops just like you see in the movies. The more they could see, the better the chance they had of anticipating the enemy's attack. But even still, some castles took this idea to the extreme, such as Castle Monte Titano, which literally looks like it's about to fall off of a cliff any moment, or Perjemski Castle, which was built into the side of a cliff face and is only partially visible from the outside. This would definitely make it difficult for anyone to attack the fortress given the rough terrain, but still, like, how did they even build that? How did you even build it? I don't even know. Just the talent, pure talent. Number nine, helmeted cock. No. I'm not talking about what you think I'm talking about. Think about how much entertainment you consume on a daily basis. You're watching me right now, scrolling on TikTok, Instagram, movies, Netflix, whatever you want to do. The desire for entertainment is strong in humanity, so medieval nobles found ways to insert the funnies into everything they could, even food. Helmeted cock was one such entertaining delicacy that delighted all of the guests behind the castle walls. It was essentially a rooster stitched to a pig and then roasted. Another game they used to play with their food was live frog and chicken. They would put live frogs into pie shells so that when someone cut into it, all these frogs would just ribbit about the dinner table. Hilarity! And then live chicken was significantly darker. They'd pluck a live chicken in boiling water in front of the guests, like in a jacuzzi, and when it passed out, they'd glaze it to look like it was cooked. Then they would lay it on the table, and when the chicken finally came to, it would bound up and down the table to the delight of the guests. This poor chicken who's like frantically being like, where the heck are my feathers? I'm naked! Just awful. Weird times. Weird, weird times. What else were they gonna do? Number eight, the art of dying. To see where I'm going with this, Check out this pic. Why does he look so calm? He's literally being stabbed in the head and like the side and everywhere else. While in real life this wouldn't actually happen, you wouldn't be this calm if you were being killed, but this was the goal. People lived in a very pious society back in the medieval ages, and what with death looming around every corner with the Black Plague, you know, they developed a very unique idea about death called Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. The idea revolved around a good Christian death, that it should be planned and peaceful. I'm going to die on December 16th, blah, 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 whatever date. They didn't actually say that, but anyways. So as medieval people were lying on their deathbed in their castle, they were expected to receive it without despair or any kind of existential crisis. You had to take it honorably, and if you didn't, it was looked down on, but then again, you were also dead, so what does that matter? But it was because of this belief that even in paintings depicting gore and death, the victim, who was stabbed in the head, always had like a calm expression, which is like, yeah, this is fine. It's a flesh wound. Number seven. A jester versus Netflix. As soon as I said jester, you pictured a tight wearing, colorful bard with a stupid hat. Probably not far off, but the nobles had to entertain themselves somehow, as previously mentioned. The castle would play host to loads of minstrels, jugglers, and acrobats. Edward II, for instance, in 1306, had hundreds at his knighting celebration. But the original meaning of the jester was just simply a good storyteller. They would wander in on dark evenings and entertain the company with fancy tales, comedic and dramatic. But soon jesters became employed full time to kings and lords. Henry II had one called Roland the Musical Farter. Very name. I wonder what he did. Every Christmas he would perform and earn a grant of the land, so they were paid pretty well. He had to be wise and quick witted in order to maintain the love of their masters. However, if they went too far. Off with her head. Tribule, the king of France's fool, once went too far and was sentenced to execution, but he got out of it when they allowed him to choose how he would die. He simply said, old age, and he was pardoned. Again, quick witted. Number six, gazing out of windows. Imagining a world where women are restricted from education, business, autonomy is thankfully getting harder and harder to do. But even without feminism, women still operated within the constraints of a patriarchal society in very important ways. It was their job to run the entire castle when the lord was away, for instance. They weren't just staring out windows, waiting to lower their hair for a handsome suitor. Medieval noblewomen, for instance, had the responsibility of running the household and enforcing it. Lords were often away on crusades 
crusades, war, court, or even just dead. So it was up to the ladies to run the estate, finances, and even to defend the castle against attack. Also, if the husband was dead, many women would choose not to remarry because you had more advantages being a widow than being married. You would essentially be treated as a man, especially with in terms of property and things like that. Religion was also incredibly important, and one of the restrictions for women at the time was that they were forbidden from touching the altar. So in order to metaphorically dance around this, they donated their clothes to the church, which would eventually be worn by the clergymen, hence they would eventually touch the altar. A very clever way of getting around this rule, but more research needs to be done about women in the medieval ages, but this is kind of what it looked like. Number 5. Shotgun Weddings Behind the closed doors of the castle walls, love lives were pretty much what you would expect them to be. Really stinky and also not about love. Marriage was politically motivated and there wasn't room for much love there. Women have women had essentially no say and both boys and girls could be married as soon as 12 to 14. However, compared to today, their ceremonies would be better compared to a shotgun wedding in Vegas than the ones we know. It would be completed in a matter of moments just by simply uttering consent. You could marry technically in the street or at dinner or at a pub or in bed after the deed is done. So, because things got so confusing by the 12th century, marriage got more complicated. It was declared a holy sacrament that must be observed by God. Observed being the key word. Not only did people actually have to see people saying I do, they had to see them do the deed. The bride was carried to the bed by the family and they would wait around until the act was complete. So you know what I mean. If you were lucky enough to live in a castle, you might have had bed curtains to shield the viewing, but they, they still heard everything that was going on. Number 4. The Mystery of Ludlow Castle Beyond weird weddings, war, and strange food performances, castles contain secrets behind their walls we may never know, such as the mystery of the White Lady of Ludlow Castle. In the 12th century, the castle was home to Marion de la Bruyere, and she had a secret. She was in love with a secret suitor with whom she would sneak into the castle each night. She would lower a rope in true Rapunzel fashion to bring her love to her. But little did she know that her mysterious love was setting a trap for her. One night he left the rope below so that more men could follow up behind him and take the castle. Bereft and betrayed, Marion stabbed her lover with his own sword. She then flung herself from the castle's walls and perished on the rocks below. To this day, people have stories of seeing a woman's white figure tumbling from the castle window, trapped in the desperate circumstances of her death. Number 3. Secret Passageways If I am ever <laughs> ever in my life, able to actually afford a house. We'll see. One of the ride or die requirements is a secret passageway or to a secret library. Like both. Both would be great, but a secret library is a must. And I will never tell anyone about it, because how cool would it be if they found it themselves? Medieval castles were filled with secret passageways and alcoves designed to help facilitate escape should the need arise. In fact, it was kind of a requirement of fortifications to have one. The main secret entrance was called the postern. It was small, therefore easy to defend, and protected by metal grates, as well as there were battlements above it. However, the entrance could be exploited if in the wrong hands. Say you have some double crossers behind your walls. They could help sneak in the enemy soldiers, such as the case of Corf Castle during the siege of 1645. An officer named Colonel Pittman helped aid enemy troops in through the postern, condemning the fate of the fort. Number 2. Where's the loo? <laughs> there are so many reasons to be thankful for modern day plumbing, but this reason above the rest. Because of plumbing, we don't need a gong farmer. What is a gong farmer? I'm not glad you asked. In castles, bathrooms were often called gongs or loos, and often overhung over the moat or onto the ground so that like whatever was happening would just drop below. There was a wooden board with a hole in it, you sat on it, did your business and got up. Simply straightforward. But sometimes the droppings fell into a cesspit like in Rochester Castle. The smell would rise up and though they didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells were unhealthy. So eventually, the pit had to be cleaned. Enter the gong farmer. This is a dirty job that even Mike Rowe would run from. They had to scoop out the stuff ferry it away and bury it. It was a dangerous job too and one poor fellow named Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Now that's a way to go. And last but not least, the Tower of London Zoo? The Tower of London has seen a lot of action since it was built by William the Conqueror in the 1070s. It has housed some of history's most famous political prisoners, but did you know that at one time it was kind of a zoo? From the 1200s to 1835, the tower housed an exotic assortment of wild animals. Lions, tigers, bears, oh my, but also elephants, monkeys, and polar bears. They were brought to the castle as gifts, and if you visit the attraction now, there are wire sculptures commemorating the beasts. In 
1235, Henry III was given leopards, though most likely they were lions, but they were just called that, by the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II. And that's where it all began. The king decided to start a zoo at the tower, and that he did. A polar bear joined the exhibit in 1252, and then an African elephant in 1255. A special enclosure was built, but sadly the elephant died only a couple years later, which was sadly the fate of most of the animals. Except for the lions, they did pretty well. 